Hello and welcome to the Chacha Wakabada Bassett Creek Oral History Podcast, where our guests discuss ways that they and other indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and played in the Chacha Wakabada watershed for thousands of years. This project was created in Minnesota Makoche, or Minnesota, the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. The project was co-led by Dr. Casey Keeler and Crystal Boyd with support from community partners. More information is included at the end of this episode. On behalf of everyone who contributed to this project, thank you for tuning in. All right. Good morning, Grant. Thank you for joining us for the Haha ha Wakdan Bassett Creek Oral History Project. So the first question um, for this project, and I know you didn't actually grow up in Golden Valley, and that's okay, um, but for how long and when did you live in the area um, that surrounds Bassett Creek and the Haha ha Wakpadan watershed? In your case, this would be Minneapolis. Oh, so how long I lived in Minneapolis? Yes. Um, I would say, I, I believe so. I mean, it was when I was in from fourth grade through graduation. So, uh, like 2007 through 2015, maybe or 2006. Okay. From 2006. So I think like nine years. Okay. So about 2006 to 2015. And that's when you left for college. Yes. All right. Do you know what brought you and your family to this area? Uh, my dad's an Episcopal priest, uh-huh. and we moved for his work. I did not know that. That's a very interesting connection to this project then and thinking about the role of faith-based communities. Mm-hmm. So we know, or I know, that you attended Breck, which is located in Golden Valley. Um, when you were a student there, what sorts of Indian education programming did they have available, if at all? Well, there wasn't um, specific Indian education available, um, but I would say like kind of under like the religion department umbrella, like um, every year we'd do like a, an all school chapel event where we'd kind of be able to share our um, cultural backgrounds with like all the other students. And that was always something I looked forward to. And it was just like a it was like a tradition to like for all the native students in the school like upper lower and middle school to like come together and um like plan out this event which is held held in the chapel at the time and um so we would you know typically have like speakers dancing singing and i was always involved with like the drum group at the time and um you know, the drum group was actually through like the Osseo area okay. um, Indian education program. So that was kind of like unofficially, like there were a number of native students from Breck who were involved in that. So we were kind of like folded into, into their group. Well, that's nice that you had the opportunity to be involved in Osseo's Indian education program, if you so choose. Um, I have a few questions that aren't on the interview um, questions list. Um, hearing you speak, and this is also due to my lack of knowledge about Breck, but what grades attend Breck? And then I also did not realize it was um, a faith-based school. So could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, they're in an Episcopal school. And um, yeah, they have, it's pre through 12, pre-K through 12. Wow. Yeah. And I was there from fifth grade through 12th grade. Okay. Yeah. That's nice too, that they did have some native programming um, for yeah. students. Do you know any idea of the numbers of native students that went there? I know when we were chatting before the interview started, you mentioned that there had always seems to be a cohort of native students. Yeah, I mean, so class sizes were pretty small, like around like maybe 80 people. Um, so I'd say the, the whole school put together, like maybe around a dozen. Okay. Maybe a little bit more than that, but um, yeah, I was pretty lucky because I had there were the Buffalo Heads, uh, mm-hmm. Eli and Ira. They're twins, and they're both in my grade. 
and then the stately family like mm-hmm. there are two of them and then the loose ears and eli and i were also had an older sister as well so and i have a younger sister and so yeah there was um i don't know a lot of there are a lot of siblings and like families mm-hmm. who went to breck native and, native and all, the, all the families you mentioned you were all relatively close in age um yeah yeah I think the Luciers were older. Most of them graduated before I got there, but um, I've I've been able to get to know them since then. And like they would also return to the school for for like the um, for different events, like um, not always for like I don't think for like the uh, the Native American Chapel event, but like for um, like other talks and stuff, they would they would come back and be able to get to network with them and stuff. I feel like this is pretty impressive, um, getting the opportunity to get to know other Native students and other Native families, even in some of the larger school districts where there's larger numbers of Native students. I don't think that that always happens or Mm -hmm. is available. So did you know any other Native families or individuals in the area outside of the Breck community? Yeah, so kind of through the Stately family, we, um, my my sister and I and my, or our family like got involved with the Osseo area of education and Indian education. And so we met a lot of native families through there who I think were primarily from the suburbs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, my dad's like a pretty involved in the native community and uh, urban native community. And um, we lived in South Minneapolis. So yeah, kind of through the church, like through the church and another maybe community events, got to know a lot of, a lot of Native people. So with your dad being a pastor and um, was the church that he worked at, did they have a primarily Native um, parishioners or members or was it? Yeah, Yeah, he's a a priest, but yeah, I, um, it was a, like an Indian mission. That's like the actual title of it. All Saints Indian Mission. And yeah, so they've historically had like native priests and um, yeah, mostly native uh, congregants, parishioners. Yeah. That is important work. Mm-hmm. So when you think about Bassett Creek um, in the Haha Wakbadan area, do you? feel like you relate to the specific geography as a native person, if at all? Excuse me. Um, well, I'm, I'm Ogallala Lakota, and I would have to say our geography is quite a bit different than uh, Minnesota. But with that said, like, you know, I didn't grow up in Golden Valley, but like I sort of did. Like I spent like most of my time there. Uh, at least through like middle school and high school and you know when I was reading over the questions I was just kind of thinking about all the like the outdoor projects we did at Breck and, like all the time I spent outside which was I think was also like a really cool part of like going there was there's a lot of um, like there's a lot of interaction and like learning about the the area that we were in like the specifically like where Breck is located it's in like a cattail marsh Mm-hmm. And I kind of learned about how that was like dredged a long time ago and um, yeah, how, how it was made possible to like build on it and just different. We, we learned about like the ecosystem in that area, which I thought was pretty cool. I don't really know if that answers the question, but. Um, it does. Did you think about, or did you have the opportunity to learn about the area? Like as a Dakota place? no yeah not really um but you know i so i feel like i i kind of had to and this was one area where i feel like breck maybe well i i feel like we kind of had to push them a little bit was like on the history side of things and you know i feel like they got a lot better about that like with with like kind of the normal curriculum and stuff like Mm -hmm. the history curriculum but definitely had to like kind of push for like more more native history basically 
And so, yeah, in general, I would say you don't really, I, I, I don't think most people really think about native history in, in Golden Valley. Right, um, I would say that's probably true of like most education systems, K through 12, regardless of where they're located. I think it's a rarity when there really is that focus or emphasis on American Indian history. Um, but there's always opportunity for improvement. So in contrast, how has going to school in the Bassett Creek area, Golden Valley, informed your identity, if at all, as a suburb, a predominantly white environment as a native person? Yeah, I mean, I feel like going to like one of the more like elite schools in the area, it's like predominantly not just white, but also like predominantly like wealthy students. And, you know, my family really isn't that. I mean, I, I feel like our real tie to Breck was not really, not even like the native community, but more like um, the Episcopal mm -hmm. community. And like, that's kind of how my parents picked the school. Um, but then it was like, I think a huge added bonus where they're like, oh, there's other native students and other native families here. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say like my time in Golden Valley and at Breck was like, you know, definitely felt like an outsider sometimes, but there was also like a really tight core of specifically in my class. I feel, I, I just feel really lucky that there were two other native guys in my in my own grade. So we were just like a really tight bunch. Right. Um, and some of these other interviews that I've done, you know, one of the other participants, she went to Minnetonka, um, which is very large and very white and very affluent. And they didn't have the opportunity um, to participate in Indian education programming. So it's interesting how we really think about the West Mestro in particular is a place of like whiteness and also varying scales of economic kind of opportunity. So I think when I think about the West Metro, you know, I think about places like Golden Valley, but also Crystal or Brooklyn Park um, and Plymouth and Minnetonka. And I think we all have ideas in our mind of then what those places look like economically as well. Um, yeah. So I, I can imagine going to a school like Breck and Golden Valley, as you mentioned, where, you know, it's also, it's white, but it's also, you know, there's a lot of wealth there too. So in thinking about um, your involvement in cultural activities, primarily it sounds like through the Osseo Indian Education Program, um, were there any activities that you partook in, in in the Minneapolis area with the urban Indian community? Um, and similarly, in terms of cultural involvement, did you ever return to your tribal community or reservation? Yeah, I mean, so I think the drum group in Osseo is kind of like the main um, like source of Indian education, I guess, or really more specifically, that was kind of like a drumming and dancing that was that was the main focus uh and then you know there i didn't really do any of that in in the city but i i, I feel like my main connection though it's like the urban native community or just the native community in minneapolis was like through my parents church and like through through who they knew pretty much and so my my dad's church has like a uh not a soup kitchen, but like kind of like a meal program. And they do like a homemade, like indigenous foods um, on, on Sundays. And most of the patrons there are native too. And so I volunteer there a lot and um, not, not really on my own accord, kind of just cause I had to, but it was a really good way to like, I mean, I was just like, in there in the community a lot of homeless folks and um yeah just people like from nearby areas like little earth and so really just kind of super involved in the community at the yeah grassroots level i guess so hearing you speak has me thinking about another question um so in 
have you reflected on your experiences during these years, you know, being a Native person, going to Golden Valley to go to school in a primarily white, um, more wealthy community, and then being involved in the church in Minneapolis with a, a largely Native community um, that did not have as much economic stability? Yeah, I mean, there's just like kind of like, I guess a duality there, but that's also something, I mean, I know that this isn't really the focus of the interview, but like, you know, my mom is white, my dad is native. Like, that's kind of just something I've always, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, lived with or tried to understand more, you know, being a part of two different communities kind of. And going back to the last question, like, like we grew up spending summers on South Dakota, like at the on the Pine Ridge Reservation and Rapid City. And like, mm -hmm. so my dad's family is all from there and like, you know, very much like a huge part of my life. But, you know, my mom's from like Georgia and like, you know, so there's just, you know, very stark differences in culture and like kind of not, maybe not being caught in between them, but just like being a part of both of them right. is like, you know, gives you a lot to think about, I guess. Right, a lot of reflection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, being how you identify yourself, your family roots and where they belong or come from, and just thinking about Native people more broadly across the region. Um, there isn't just like one Native identity, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Haha Wakpadan is the Dakota name for Bassett Creek. What do you think about the role and importance of language and place names, particularly in predominantly white settler spaces? Well, um, you know, I'm a, I guess I'm a pretty big fan of like the common use of native words and stuff like as place names and I think it's like super cool and like it I think it really kind of like denotes the history mm -hmm. and you know I think it would just be a real shame if we stopped using like native words to des to describe places because you know I I just think it's a really cool like kind of you know combination of of native history and then like um so yeah I, I don't know it just kind of reminds you of of who was here and like what happened and stuff. And I was, um, I was pretty involved in, or I mean, I, uh, I did a research project on uh, Bidet Makaska and, but that was before the name was changed mm -hmm. and um, wrote, wrote co co-authored like an op-ed in the Star Tribune about like changing the name and stuff. So I was, I was feeling pretty passionate about that in like high school for sure. So did you have the opportunity to meet Kate and Carly Bean during that time and in their involvement in that name change no. process? Um, I did my PhD at the same time as Kate Bean. We both have our degrees from the University of Minnesota American Studies program. So it was a very exciting time when that name change came about. That's awesome. Um, do you wanna say any more about your research that you did um, around Cloud Man's Village? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, I got to do this really cool project through um, Breck's Advanced Science Research Program. And like, um, it was like really tailored to my interests, which were history mostly, but it was a science project because we, we drilled like a core sample out of the lake and uh, like analyzed, I analyzed like the pollen grains in it and like, was just kind of like, yeah, like they were farming at this time. And that's, it's really cool. It was like a Dakota agricultural village and stuff. So yeah, it was, it was just a great like professional development opportunity to like learning how to present and do stuff like that. But yeah, I got to go to like a Native American science fair and stuff and um, do some other really cool things with that. Yeah, I think so much about this project and what it's about is like making clear that Native, that Dakota history that we're so familiar with in places like Minneapolis and Bidet Makaska and expanding that horizon 
to suburban places like Golden Valley and the Haha ha Wakpadan watershed. So some people that I've talked about, talked to, you know, we've talked about what would it mean to change the name of Bassett Creek to Haha ha Wakpadan and what could that mean for learning opportunities um, for youth in the area, schools, um, and having access to outdoor education. Would that be something that would have excited you in your younger days as a school student or something that even seems appealing now, thinking about a, the potential um, for a name change? Yeah, I mean, you know, just like putting myself in like a middle schooler or high schooler's shoes, like native high schooler or whatever, I would be very excited, I think, um, for it to like, kind of surface and for that to be like something that we discuss, you know, like make it like a kind of a prominent issue or feature, you know, and so yeah, I, I think that that would be like really, I would have really enjoyed that I think if it, if it came up in class and stuff. So this American Indian Oral History Project grew out of a land acknowledgement process. What are your thoughts on land acknowledgement statements? And then after the work has been done to create a responsible land acknowledgement statement, what are follow-up or supplementary work um, that you would like to see? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think land acknowledgements are really well-intentioned for the most part. Um, I just think it's tough if like all the work behind it kind of falls on like native folks and stuff but obviously I think native people should be consulted on it and stuff like that but you know I that's what I think sets this project apart is like I don't think I've heard of like a, you know kind of like a full-scale grant opportunity coming out of a land acknowledgement and because usually it, it can just kind of be um you know paying uh, well it, you know it just won't mean much like if, if it's just kind of words mm -hmm. words on paper or whatever so yeah, I, I mean, ideally, I think land acknowledgements mean something more than just like kind of a signal that right, like an end point. Like, hey, we did yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen? Um, is there any any other organizations or institutions that have you seen that you have seen do land acknowledgement statements and then some other sort of action? Yeah, not, not really that I can think of, you know, um, I mean, my, my college kind of did some a little bit, but, you know, usually that's also kind of just like a proclamation or like, right. you know, um, having a few native students get up and talk about, you know, like the community or like the land that we're, we're on. And then that's about as far as it goes usually. Right. Yeah, I do agree um, that this project is exciting, thinking about the role of the church and taking the initiative to apply for grants to get funding to support support the project um, as it unfolds and whatever that looks like and being open to that. Um, and here we are in the um, oral history project. I'll also share, um, knowing kind of your background, that the Valley Community Presbyterian Church They've also, you know, had some dialogue and discussion with other faith-based communities in the area and thinking about how this can serve as a model for other faith-based institutions to do something similar. So I think that's also exciting, um, seeing the role of faith-based institutions and kind of what they can do to further this conversation. Um, and we've also had really good conversations, myself and folks from the Valley Community Presbyterian Churches you know, thinking about the role of the church in particular um, and the history of boarding schools and native communities. And this church, um, Valley Community Presbyterian Church, um, was established in the early 1950s, so it doesn't have that history, but certainly there are other Presbyterian churches that do. So that's something we've had the opportunity to talk about and the church learn about as well. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about the actual watershed, is there any advice that you would like to give those who help manage and steward the Haha ha Wakpadan, Bassett Creek watershed and the surrounding areas today? 
um, or any particular changes or initiatives that you would like to see. And this is kind of in particular um, centering on the environmental aspect. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't really consider myself like a environmental expert or anything like that, but you know, as 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 like a native student who did um, like a research project on like the environment and like, you know, I feel like if it's possible to like involve native students on um, efforts like that and like give them work experience and stuff like that, that would be like a really awesome like a, initiative that they could do. So maybe trying to find like native students in Golden Valley or surrounding areas to like get involved with that. That'd be yeah, it's a great, great experience. I like that response. Um, I'm learning quite a bit about the watershed myself through these interviews. So I've learned, you know, the watershed has been quite polluted and that once the watershed or the creek itself kind of gets to Minneapolis, it's tunneled underground. So there's mm -hmm. also conversation of what would it look like to daylight the entirety of Bassett Creek. And I do think getting native youth involved um, is a good opportunity in general, but also a good opportunity in terms of education. So in thinking about yourself as a native person going to school in a predominantly white suburb, is there any advice or words of wisdom you would like to share um, with future generations of native students? Yeah, I mean, I would just say like, maybe this isn't really advice, but just kind of what I did was like, I had people to look up to, like other native students to look up to and not even just students, but just like professionals or like art artists and stuff like that. And, um, you know, like the Erdrich family, yes. uh, they went to Breck or one of their, one of their kids goes to Breck right now. And, um, so yeah, just like looking up to people like that and, uh, just kind of being like, wow, I want to make, make an impact too, or I want to do something with a native history or native studies. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I would just say like picking your role models and like, you know, trying to, trying to learn about what they did and like, that's the easiest way to do it. Like just kind of following in someone else's footsteps, at least to start out. Are you involved with um, Bruck at all now as an alumni? Um, not really, not yet. I want. I, I would like to be though eventually. I, I was just thinking, hearing you speak, that maybe you will be that role model that somebody else, a young student, will look up to someday. <laughs> it comes kind of full circle. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I mean, I just, I just saw like. Um, native students who like went to Dartmouth and stuff. And I was just like, oh my God, like I got to do that. And like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then um, one of the Lucier's, her, her last name is Six Killer now though, like her husband, like I've been able to network with him and kind of, he, he's a lawyer and stuff. And so, yeah, it's just like kind of picking, picking your, old, your role models and like, yeah. It works. I don't know. No, I agree. It is good to have native role models. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share that we may have missed during our conversation today? No, I mean, just like, you know, some of those projects that we did in science classes, like where we spent time outdoors and, um, yeah, like learning about the, the local environment was probably some of my favorite times uh, in school, like just getting out of the classroom and like being able to be outside and thinking about nature was kind of like, when I think back to Breck, like that was just a, a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And the area too, I just, yeah, I really, really like that area a lot. That's good to hear, you know, I don't know who will listen to these interviews or read the transcripts, but if they can serve a purpose in terms of education and what education can look like, not just for native students, but all students and the importance of getting outside um, and working and learning from the land. Um, and that's something that has been shared by other participants in this project as well. 
Well, thank you so much, Grant. I'm going to go ahead and stop um, our interview recording for today. Sounds good. Naya Chupna Picha, Wopira Tonka Ungeni Chiapi. Thank you for listening. This project may serve as a model for other communities that seek to go beyond land acknowledgement. To learn more about this oral history project, please contact Hennepin History Museum. The project was produced following the standards and principles of the Oral History Association. In addition to this podcast, the interview recordings, transcripts, and narrator files included signed legal released agreements can be found at the Hennepin History Museum. Funding and other support was provided by the St. Anthony's Falls Heritage Board, Hennepin History Museum, Valley Community Presbyterian Church, and the University of Wisconsin. This publication was also made possible in part by the people of Minnesota through a grant funded by an appropriation to the Minnesota Historical Society from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Any views, findings, opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this publication are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent those of the state of Minnesota, the Minnesota Historical Society, or the Minnesota Historic Resources Advisory Committee. Anaya Chopta Pecha Wopira Unkenichiapi. Thank you for listening.